for the John Yu oration, which will be followed by a Q&A. So please don't be shy. Um, I love a lively panel. What about you? Then it'll be time for the presentation of the John Yu Medal and we'll adjourn to the Macquarie Room for drinks and canapes. That's going to fly. We're tremendously honoured to have Sir Gustav Nossel here with us this evening to talk about progress in global immunisation. I would now like to introduce the Chairman of the George Institute for Global Health. Please make welcome Michael Hawker. Thank you, Philippa, and welcome everybody this evening. I was uh, going to say a few words, but the Prime Minister's said a few words on my behalf, so it was, uh, it was a bit of a surprise to me, in fact. Uh, can I just well, can I welcome you all here tonight, and particularly our very eminent uh, guest of honour, Sir Gus. Uh, great to have you here this evening. I'd like to also uh, welcome uh, Dr John Yu, who's my predecessor and very other, another eminent Australian medical man. Uh, we've got uh, the Honourable Melinda Pavey, representing the Premier of New South Wales, so thank you very much. And we've got uh, Dr Andy McDonald, the Shallow Minister for Health here. And we've got the Chancellor of this University, uh, Melinda Hutchison. Just want to say a couple of quick words about the George and uh, some idea, some background to the oration. Firstly, we, we uh, set up the oration really to honour an eminent Australian in the fields of science or medicine, uh, and then to have them speak and to present them with a medal, which is named after John Yu and Professor Robin Norton. will say something about John Yu just after I say a few words before uh, Sir Gus speaks. The George started in 1999. It started uh, with a couple of professors, I think about three people. Uh, there's now 400 people, uh, plus 400 people in the George. So in a very short period of time, we've gone from five or six to over 400. Started the University in Sydney um, by uh, uh, a couple of principals, uh, Robin uh, Norton and Professor Steve McMahon, and uh, a couple of other people very like-minded at, at that period of time. Uh, the focus is very much on leveraging healthcare. How do we get work on preventative health as much as anything else? 90% of uh, all money spent on healthcare once someone's had a disease or had an injury, and therefore only 10% on prevention. We're very much looking at the other end. How do we deal with prevention of that? The focus on chronic disease. Um, we are associated with the Universities of Sydney, uh, Peking University in, uh, in uh, Beijing, Hyderabad University, we've got an office in Delhi, uh, and with now Oxford University with the uh, Nuffield School of Medicine. Uh, so, and, and we've been voted the number one most effective medical research institute in the world in, in 2011 out of uh, 3,500 medical research institutes. Uh, so what the work they do is very effective. I think what interests me is it's, a, it's an area of um, philanthropy and, and research which is hugely leveraged. So from the reason why I got involved was when uh, I like to see my time and effort going to something which I think is leveraged. And what they do is... Uh, leverage change in medical practice that actually makes he healthcare more affordable for everyone in the world. And when you think about that in policy formulation, it's a big issue for us long term, both in the OECD world and in emerging markets. And if you can provide better care upfront before you're likely to suffer a heart attack or, a, you know, or some sort of other cardiovascular event or renal event or obesity, then the, the medical healthcare cost is dramatically reduced uh, for society around the world and more accessible. The other thing I like about them is they organise themselves in a market-based principle in that they essentially uh, you they collect good people and good researchers. In fact, if you're not a good enough researcher to get a government grant or, or to be able to be hired to do some medical research, then it's tough to stay in the place. So we've got a market-based principle, so they, every cent you put into the organisation is effectively well-managed. The last thing I'd like to say is that I think it's one of those great... Um, untold success stories of an amphibian organisation. The fact that you can take something internationally, be world recognised internationally in 15 years, go from five people to 400. Your research is used globally in medical practice, in, uh, in cardiovascular processes and in drugs uh, globally, I think is uh, a fantastic achievement. And um, one of the reasons we have this oration tonight is to make that more public to people of influence in Australia so you understand really and highlight what they do. So thank you for coming this evening. I hope you have a very enjoyable evening. I hope you learn a lot about the George. And uh, if there's any support or help that you can provide us, it would be greatly received. But tonight is really uh, to enjoy the night to hear a great person speak of medical research. Uh, and, uh, 
and it's a reason not too late. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike, and good evening. On behalf of the staff of the Institute, it's also my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for coming uh, this evening. As the Prime Minister indicated, while well, he didn't get everything right, we haven't been in about for 25 years, 15 years, but he was right about John Yu. I think many of you respect John and know John, and I'm sure in, the, in part that's the reason you're here tonight. At the Institute, we're particularly proud um, of having had a long association with John, beginning, of course, with his term as chairman of the George Institute's board. <coughs> While we have much to thank John for during his chairmanship, of particular relevance was his passion and enthusiasm for engagement between Australia and Asia, and his support for us as we first broached the idea of establishing offices in the region. Indeed, under John's chairmanship, we launched both the George Institute in China and the George Institute in India in 2007. The establishment of the John Yu Oration and Medal in 2012 provided an opportunity for us to formally recognise John's contributions to the Institute and to pay tribute to his passion for Australian engagement in the region. Our vision in creating the oration was to promote opportunities for ongoing dialogue about Australia's place in the world, especially in improving the health status of those in less fortunate circumstances than ours. I have no doubt that tonight's speaker, Sir Gus Nossel, will do justice to our aspirations. Tonight, though, it is also my pleasure to announce a further tribute to John. This evening, we are launching the establishment of the Dr. John Yu Fellowship Program. Three prestigious three-year awards are being created. An award will be made annually to the best and brightest of the next generation of healthcare researchers from Asia, allowing them to complete doctoral studies at the George Institute and the University of Sydney. We would like to invite you to contribute to this program, which has been initiated by do personal donations from the board and directors of the Institute. Information about the program and pledge cards will be available during the reception following the oration. We hope that you will support this initiative and it is our intention to make the first award at the 2015 John Yu Oration, which will be held in Beijing. We would, of course, welcome you all to join us on that occasion. But to the present, I look forward to hearing tonight's orator, Sir Gus Nossel, the recipient of the 2014 John Yu Award. Thank you, Robin. I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Sir Gustav Nossel, a world-renowned scientist. Sir Gus has been fundamental in building the foundations of modern immunology. His research accomplishments are world-renowned, with his work confirming Burnett's theory of antibody formation, a watershed in understanding the human immune system. He has defined the field for more than 30 years and he's a hugely significant figure in Australia's medical and scientific community. Born in Austria, Sagas arrived in Australia speaking no English. Regardless, he graduated from St Aloysius as ducks of his class and entered Sydney University's medical school where he earned a PhD by the age of 29. So Gustav has been listed in the Australia Day Honours on four <coughs> separate occasions along with receiving a Companion of the Order of Australia and being named Australian of the Year in 2000. Sir Gus is directly involved with the World Health Organisation and recently sat in the position of Chairman of the Global Programme for Vaccines and Immunisation. As the President of the Australian Academy of Science, he has contributed to government policy making 
and has been an influential public commentator on scientific and medical issues for decades. We are honoured to have the namesake of the Nossel Institute for Global Health Care with us today, presenting on the topic of progress in global immunisation. Welcome to Gus. Philippa, Michael, Robin, thank you so very much for the warm welcome and what a tremendous honour it is to be the guest of the Global Institute for the George Institute for Global Health to deliver the 2014 John Yu Oration. I have had the greatest admiration for Dr Yu for just about half a lifetime. And uh, the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children was one of my very favourite pla places as a medical student uh, during uh, the 40s and 50s. I was, of course, blown away, totally blown away by the new Westmead Children's Hospital, which was largely John Yu's creation. And what uh, very apposite words these are, total healing environment. And he has made this one of the world's truly great children's hospitals. John Yu strongly supported the two things for which I most value the uh, Children's Hospital, namely the uh, very fine research institute and also the immunisation section headed first by Margaret Burgess and then by Peter McIntyre, David Isaacs and their team. They absolutely lead Australia in everything to do with immunisation policy and in point of fact have been strongly supported by John Yu. Now, the two of us do have several things in common. We both came to Australia as little boys, so you see, we're asylum seekers. <laughs> <laughs> we both went to Sydney University Medical School. We both had the bulk of our careers at a single iconic institution. We both managed to create an international standard building. And both, dare I say it, have had the unique privilege of being Australia of the Year. So to be tied up with you, John, in this further uh, adventure is a really great pleasure. Of course, I'm also a great fan of the George Institute. Ever since John Chalmers first introduced me to the concept, I've been absolutely blown away, literally blown away, by what has been achieved in a scant 15 years. Its work in health policy and practice in 50 countries with four bases in Australia, China, India and UK, is absolutely outstanding. And of course you can imagine my great delight when <coughs> just a couple of days ago I learnt that a colleague of, again, 20 years or more standing, Terry Dwyer, has been appointed the head of the UK uh, branch. Terry, of course, was first director of the Menzies Institute in Hobart and then for seven years as the director of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute which he built up tremendously. And so here he is now as part of the George family, an altogether riveting and wonderful story. Now, my story here today really begins with Edward Jenner, the Glo uh, Gloucestershire general practitioner who discovered that pus from the saw of a milkmaid with uh, cowpox could be inoculated into a person and be protected against the horrible disease smallpox, uh, which in fact uh, killed five million people per year uh, before the eradication program. The first disease totally eradicated from the face of the planet. And what was the World Health Organization going to do for an encore? Well, in a partnership with Rotary International, it decided to try to get rid of polio in the same way. And to do this, they embraced certain key strategies. They decided to use the save an oral polio vaccine, which is drops, rather than have to have injections of the soft vaccine. They encouraged, of course, high routine infant coverage with vaccines. But the really big invention which turned the corner was these NIDs, the National Immunization Days. Uh, you see, not everybody takes their kids to the vaccination clinics at 6, 10 and 14 weeks. But 
during these NIVs, the whole childhood population, all under five-year-old kids, are lined up and given the drops regardless of previous immunization history. So it doesn't matter if you had the full gamut, you've dragged along, there's a great deal of media publicity, often the head of state or the first lady is the head of the National Immunization Day, and that captures the hard-to-catch kids. You have to have, of course, good surveillance, there are other causes of paralysis, you have to have laboratory confirmation, and you certainly have to have very prompt measures for outbreak control during the end stage <coughs> Uh, when the thing is nearly gone from the country uh, by giving two lots of oral polio vaccine two weeks apart around the index case. And that's resulted in a 99% plus reduction in the number of cases of polio. But there are still three countries in which the disease has not been eradicated, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Nigeria, where in fact now all the cases are just strain one of the three strains of polio. And importantly and sadly, uh, countries are sometimes stupid. When the thing is certified as being eradicated, they stop the routine immunisation. You shouldn't do that. And that leaves you susceptible to importation. Now, of the endemic countries, Pakistan is the worst, particularly in the border zones and in the areas where the Taliban are most active. And we have a terrible situation now of quite a few of the vaccinators having been killed. Uh, but there have been importations to other countries. Syria is an interesting case. They have eradicated polio 10 years previously. But, you know, law and order has broken down there. They've stopped their routine immunisation. And they had 36 cases in 2013. Fortunately, we got on top of it fairly quickly. And uh, that virus actually hopped over from Pakistan. So, you see, the virus doesn't know geographical borders. It travels. And the case of Israel is very interesting because they keep monitoring their sewage and they found some wild polio, polio virus 1, in the sewage. Now, it didn't cause any, it didn't cause any paralysis because they immunised their kids with salt. But interestingly enough, salt does not sufficiently immunise the gastrointestinal tract. So these kids carry the polio virus, it doesn't enter the bloodstream, it doesn't get to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, which causes the paralysis but they are a potential risk to unimmunised kids. So what they did now, to interrupt transmission nationwide, all children under 10 in Israel were given the same and oral polio vaccine. Now there is a very well articulated end game plan, it's going to be expensive. Uh, we will eradicate the disease in the last three endemic countries. We will maintain both the surveillance and the lab capacity. We'll attempt to simultaneously cease, cease the saline vaccine in all countries and hopefully develop cheaper forms of the soft vaccine so that there can be something like one to five rounds of salt. That's not yet quite determined by the World Health Organization. I think it is probably a bit theoretical to consider the use of antivirals for those chronic shedders who have an immune deficiency disorder. I think that's put in there for completeness. I don't know how you're going to find them. Um, we will have to contain the polio virus. Lab stocks, that wasn't escaped from a lab after the disease is gone. And of course improve the routine immunisation. And of course you don't want to lose, lose all those human skills. So there will be legacy planning, uh, transitioning the infrastructure and personnel to whatever might be the next big global health force. And this is going to be costly. It's going to cost about a billion a year for the next five years and something like 200 million afterwards. But the job's got to be done. It will be a terrible thing if having gone this far, we now let it go and have the disease come right back. Mm -hmm. Now, where is... Uh oh that's one slide too. Yep. What's happened to the big three? AIDS, malaria and TB. Well, the AIDS pandemic has peaked. There were 1.5 million deaths in 2013 versus 2.3 million in 2005. But there's still a couple of million new infections every year. There are 35 million people living with HIV. 35 million. And of those, 13 million are on antiretroviral therapy and leading relatively normal lives. But 19 million more should be 
according to the revised guidelines of WHO, which now promote rather earlier commencement of treatment. And the funding is truly massive. Uh, 19 billion from all sources, 9 billion from two funds, the President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, arguably the best thing that George W. Bush ever did, and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. But actually the annual need estimated for 2015 is even more than that, it's 22 billion. It's going to be hard to get every single one of those people treated. And where is the AIDS vaccine? Well, after many, many disappointments, there's been the tiniest hint of success with a vaccine called RV144 from Sanofi Pasteur, which gave 31% protection in a big Thai trial amongst men who have sex with men. It's a prime boost vaccine, don't worry about the technical details. One terrible thing is that this vaccine required six injections. It's not very practical. But, not deterred, the Gates Foundation, having spent a lot of money on that, is now doing P5, Pox Protein Public-Private Partnership. Uh, it's got a modest goal, it wants to up to 31% to 50%, because they don't think the vaccine can be deployed at less than 50%. And that's going to uh, require what we call an advert. And amazing enough, two bitter rivals in the marketplace, two European manufacturers, Sanofi Pasteur and Novartis, have actually come together, linked hands, and be in partnership to try to develop this, but it's still years away. Interestingly, the first Nobel Prize in medicine was given to Emma von Behring for treatment of diphtheria with antisera, in this case made by horses. Now, would you believe there's a very active campaign now to treat AIDS sufferers like, uh, like um, uh, egg and globulin in any kids? There are monoclonal antibodies derived from humans, humans who exceptionally make broadly active uh, anti-HIV antibodies. We can now immortalize those by what we call hybridoma technology. Uh, there are 19 monoclonals with this broadly neutralizing activity under intensive study. There's been chemical modification to increase the half-life. The half-life of antibodies is already long. It's two weeks as opposed to a drug which will be gone in a day or two. And a cocktail of these has got real potential, but this treatment, or if you want this prevention, will be expensive. That is a worry. There are other candidates in development. One very interesting one is a Canadian one, which is a carbon copy of the salt vaccine. It's actually just killed virus particles. Ought to have some chance of working. Now, malaria is basically another relative success story, another area where we must not stop. There's still over 600,000 deaths per year. That's a 45% reduction since 2000. And the most brilliant success has been the insecticide impregnated bed nets, which by themselves with no other treatment can halve the mortality. Uh, and there's 200 million of those going to be issued in 2014. The plan is to have at least 700 million out there mainly in Africa. There are new chemo attractants for traps, new chemo repellents for personal protection, all funded by Gates. And there are what we call artemisinine combination therapy which is highly effective. And uh, that artemisinin is a Chinese discovery, exactly 2,000 years old. Uh, it comes from the sweet wormwood tree. The Chinese themselves purified it, identified the molecules. Now we have <coughs> semi-synthetic artemisinin made in yeast by genetic engineering, highly welcome, lest we run out of sweet wormwood trees. Se uh, Seven billion people in the world, and a lot of them require protection. Then there's intermittent prophylactic therapy for pregnant women and infants. And in the very high endemicity areas, we have monthly chemo prevention for children. Where is the malaria vaccine? Well, the most advanced candidate this time comes from GlaxoSmithKline with a great collaboration, now a quarter of a century old, with the US Department of Defense. And it comprises the outer a protein from the outer coat of that form of the parasite which the mosquito injects into your skin. It's called the sporozoite. And so it tries to nip the infection in the bud at the very beginning. Phase three trials are still underway in 11 sites in seven African countries, 
involves over 15,000 kids, very expensive. And uh, uh, of course, when you go in with a vaccine, as you can imagine, ethics forces you to very strongly promote the bed nets and very strongly promote female prophylaxis. So the trial is difficult because if you go in there, the disease is going to get better anyway. And then, of course, you've got to have controls to, in this case, get another vaccine, an irrelevant vaccine. Uh, the trial is, you know, going along well, but in fact, the results, to be frank, have been a bit disappointing. Something like 50% protection in toddlers, very poor protection in infants, and uh, not very long lasting. So, this I don't think is the right vaccine, but I think uh, we're in so deep with it now, and so much money has been spent, that we've got to see this through to its logical conclusion. There have been no deaths, no adverse events, so the adverse events are reasonable. The price will be the cost of the manufacturer plus prices, as I was saying that to some of the colleagues from the George Institute. Industries come to the butty big time in this third world situation. But there will have to be other stages of the parasite added in a second generation vaccine. Now the fight against tuberculosis. It's been argued that tuberculosis may be history's worst killer. Estimated deaths of a billion people in recent centuries, surpassing even smallpox, <coughs> malaria, malaria and bubonic plague. There's a eight and a half million people are new tuberculosis patients each year. And of course, TB and HIV is a very bad combination because the HIV bug hits the very cells, we call them T cells, that control TB. So you're left defenseless against TB. We get more precise diagnosis now and we're starting to uh, move away from the old tried and trusty DOTS therapy, directly observable therapy short term. Short term means six months for the cocktail of drugs. Six months is too long. And there's this brilliant trial, NC001, which is an entirely new combination of drugs, which does in fact render the sputum bacterially negative within two weeks. So cautiously, they're going to give this for the first four months, and there are further two-month trials contemplated for later on. Where are we with respect to the tuberculosis vaccine? Not very far is the answer to that one. There are at least 12 uh, attempts in clinical trial, and a bitter, bitter disappointment was when the vaccine from Oxford by Helen McShane and Adrian Hill bombed out. Everybody thought this would work on the basis of uh, animal trials, including <coughs> quite a few species of non-human primates. We've got to remember people are like chimpanzees, but they're not really chimpanzees. Tough luck. It's a tough, tough world out there. And so this vaccine bombed out. But there are other examples, and there are some in phase 2b trials. I'm quite interested in this GlaxoSmithKline one, because that's very, very like, in principle, the new vaccine for whooping cough. So that most of you know we no longer give the pertussis bacterium as a killed bacterium. We give it as a series of molecules from uh, the bug. Much purer vaccine, much less reactogenic. And that one is in uh, late phase two trials. Now, this is a good news story. Uh, at round about the same time, uh, and well, as the polio thing really cranked up, the WHO launched what is called Gavi. But when I say the WHO launched it, it really was Gates. This has been the most magnificent one and a half billion dollar uh, donation so far from Gates. The Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, which seeks to bring the uh, important vaccines to the 73 poorest countries in the world. 440 million extra children have been immunised. It wouldn't have been without Gavi. Six and a half million deaths have been averted. And you mightn't think that increase in coverage of infants from 66% to 82% is much. But believe me, that is actually a triumph. Because we're dealing with poor countries with poor health infrastructure and you're getting reasonably close to the level of coverage where some herd immunity begins to creep in and you even get the non-immunised kids protected. Beyond the basic six vaccines, which have been here for Yonks, namely diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus, polio, measles, and BCG for tuberculosis, we have several other high-priority vaccines, 
those objects, I suppose, will be most interested in the human papilloma virus, seeing as Ian Fraser discovered its vaccine against the virus which causes cervical cancer in women. The budget of Gaza is about two billion. It needs to be more. There are still 22 million infants born into this world unimmunized each year. Now, I'm pretty proud of this one. Uh, this was one of the fruits of my heavy labours with Gates since 1997. It's called Menafrivac. Now, periodic epidemics of meningococcal meningitis, the worst form of meningitis, uh, usually caused by Neisseria meningitis, serogroup A, sweep across the sub-Saharan so-called meningitis belt from Senegal to Ethiopia, and it's 450 million people that live in that vulnerable area during the dry season. And the Gates Foundation launched this meningitis vaccine program, program with a bribe. It put 70 million bucks on the table and said, count out their companies, compete for my 70 million bucks, but you've got to promise me a vaccine for a certain price. You've got to tell me what that price will be if you're successful. And the competition was won by the Serum Institute of India, which put a price of 50 cents per dose on the table. And uh, Mark LaForce, the distinguished Canadian pediatrician, was the boss of that program. And they had remarkable success. Uh, the first stage of the game is to immunise everyone between 1 and 29 years. When that's done, then we'll start on infants. But this is if you want a catch-up campaign par excellence. And uh, over 150 million have been immunised so far. 50 million in 2013 alone. You know, that's a big program. And uh, we'll reach uh, 300 million in the next few years. And most importantly, most importantly, NATO pharyngeal carriage of this strain of meningitis has been essentially wiped out, down to 98%. So that bodes very, very well for the future. And also, the vaccine is really good. There has been not one single case of meningitis due to Neisseria meningitis to Serum Group A among Africans who have been vaccinated since 2010. That's pretty remarkable. Now, I'm very interested in the work of Mark Kendall, whom some, some of you may know. This is the nanopatch vaccine for painless, needle-free delivery. Mark Kendall's from the University of Queensland. He's founded a spin-out company called Vaxas to develop this technology. And as you can see on the bottom right-hand corner there, the nanopatch is smaller than a postage stamp. It's packed with, uh, with 3,000 microscopic projections onto which the vaccine is dry-coated. And it's applied to the skin by this little applicator that you can see on the bottom left-hand side. And within a very short time, the micro-projections begin to release their uh, vaccine substance, the antigens as we call them, and they release it to cells that are antigen-capturing scavenger cells, very, very superficially in the skin. And they're there, they're basically just waiting for something to hit them. And that's why you can get away with a so much lower dose. The anti-influenza one is of great importance because were there to be a pandemic of bird flu or swine flu, there wouldn't be enough eggs in the world to mass produce the vaccine of the dosage that we have to give it now. But if you can reduce the dose by 100, then you've got 100 times more doses. Potentially very important. And as this vaccine is freeze-dried, no cold chain is required, and it could be mailed in bulk. You essentially have this postage stamp with rolls that you then cut up in local plates. It's cheap to produce. For the HPV, human papilloma virus side, this has been licensed to Merck. Merck would be interested in taking up licenses for other vaccines as well. And the full clinical trials will take place later this year. At the moment, Mark Kendall is the only person in the world that actually has it. Pigs have had it, monkeys have had it, it works beautifully, mice, it works all that. Uh, and he's got a good tradition there. He said, well, I'll make sure it works on me. But, you know, the clinical trials, as you know, they're not an easy thing, and getting all the ethical permissions and so forth. But it will start in PNG this year. And that means we can, if we're lucky and skillful and work hard, we can have a launch in five years' time. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a long game we're playing. This is tough stuff, which is why the progress is so hard.
Now, I wouldn't want to think that vaccines are the only things that we have in our armamentarium. I'm very interested in this work of Scott O'Neill from Monash University and Ari Hoffman from Melbourne University, which uses a harmless bacterium, Wolbachia, isolated from fruit flies, which can affect the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that carry dengue in this particular case, um, and then spread rapidly through the population by vertical transmission via the female. So you release some hundreds or thousands of mosquitoes, let them go, they've kept a while back in, and they'll gradually infect the, uh, uh, the wild mosquitoes. And what this uh, uh, wild back here does, which is entirely harmless to humans, it blocks dengue virus transmission. Uh, the strain WML POP is incredibly effective blocker of all four serotypes of the dengue virus. But the strain WML, somewhat less effective blocker, but a much better spreader. So you see, they'll have to keep doing work on these different variants of the of the wild back here and different mutants till they get that balance absolutely right. But there's been some good trials in Cairns and Queensland uh, which in fact showed that uh, uh, four months after release of the test mosquitoes, 80% of the wild w mosquitoes carried the wild back here and the results in Vietnam were not quite as good, 40% carried uh, and field trials are also being planned in Brazil and in Indonesia. Now, a few words on a different side of the story, and that's the financial side. I want to talk to you about aid. Definitions of aid are changing, and aid is falling. 20% of aid never leaves the donor country. Aid was, global aid was 80 billion in 2000, 125 billion in 2011 when it peaked. It's fallen 6% since then. And the United Nations itself mandated that the rich countries should give 0.7% of their gross national income of aid. It actually is a man only 0.3%. And the health component of that aid, that's all aid, varies from country to country. It's usually in the vicinity of about 10%. What about Australia? Who remembers when Labor grandly promised that by the Millennium Development Goal Year 2015, no, by 2015, 2015, our aid would reach 0.5% of GI. Immediately embraced by the opposition, bipartisan policy. Yes, this will happen. What happens next? Labor hits a, hits a tough budget, then pushes the goal out to 2016-17. Labor loses office, the coalition comes in, immediately cuts aid by 11%, then further over the following three years, to save a total of $4.5 billion. And, by the way, our asylum seeker policies come out of that aid budget. Did you know that? All of that expensive stuff on Manus Island, and Christmas Island, so it all comes out of the aid budget. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they axed the Quango uh, Oz aid uh, that uh, has been stopped in the important body is now part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Are the rich, the rich countries just a little selfish? Just a few good fun statistics here. 120 billion for annual aid. Jeffrey Sachs, the uh, distinguished health economist from Columbia University, believes to reach the Millennium Development Goals, we need to double that. Well, it just so happens that the world's aid performance equals what we spend on pet food, or what we spend on perfume. And the one that I particularly like is that it's within the sort of same ballpark as what we spend on pornography. <laughs> now, the most sterile part of this debate is the one that says, oh, no, 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 we don't want aid, we need trade. We need aid and trade. But some of these countries, or the 73 poorest countries of the Gavi countries, have got so little money that they have nothing to trade. It's bootless to say we need trade. You need both, of course. And as the countries emerge from poverty, they will not only increase global commerce, and they will not only reduce the global inequities, but it will lead to a lessening of the hatred and violence that comes through extreme uh, inequities. A contrast in style. Every single letter that you get from Gates 
begins with the statement, every life has equal value. Bill and Melinda Gates believe that their kids' lives have the same value as the life of a kid in Bangladesh or Sierra Leone or Ecuador. What does Julie Bishop think? Julie Bishop is proud that she's going to stabilise Australia's foreign aid budget at five billion a year. So instead of the aid to uh, G, uh, the appeal of GNI being uh, 0.5% the bipartisan pledge, instead of it being at the UN target, 0.7%, it's in fact at 0.3%. How generous is the lucky country? Now this, I think, this last substantive slide is the most important slide of my talk. I pitched this from Bill Gates. I think it's just an extremely telling slide. If you take total deaths in children under five, in 1960 there were 20 million. And last year there were 6 million. Three times fewer deaths from a much bigger population base. And this isn't rocket science. This is due to scaling up of basic health interventions uh, which um, include vaccines, malaria prevention control, better control of diarrhoea and acute respiratory diseases. Simple things like that. And that little blue triangle tells the story. You see now, we have two choices. We can either stop at the level of help that we're giving now, that gives us a straight line, or we can keep on trying to improve and driving those numbers of deaths further down. <coughs> and what's inside the blue triangle? Just a mere 27 million deaths. We're talking big stuff here. So please don't let people tell you all of the aid is wasted, all of the aid ends up in the bank accounts of Swiss bank accounts of corrupt dictators. Maybe some of it does, but it's aid that's done that. So we've talked about three things, haven't we? We've talked about money. We've talked on that last slide about is the glass half full, is the glass half empty? In other words, we've talked about hope versus despair. And we've thrown in a little bit of science. I simply wanted to tell you what three wise old birds had to say about this. Sorry that one of them isn't a woman, that's a mistake over there. Fix for the next lesson. So it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, it's health that is the real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. And in terms of the hope versus the despair, I love this quote from Seamus Heaney. When Seamus Heaney, the Irish Nobel laureate poet, learnt of Nelson Mandela's release from prison, he said, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rise. But I guess we need to leave, leave the very last word to an immunologist, who other than Louis Pasteur, <coughs> who said science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch which illuminates the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Gus. Please take a seat here on stage and if I could ask Professor Stephen McMahon and Professor Robin Norton, Principal Directors of the George Institute Global Health, to the stage for a Q&A. <coughs> and I'd ask you to put up your hands if you've got a question and, uh, and then I'll throw to you, you'll be handed a microphone and if you'd just be kind enough to identify yourself before asking the question, everyone would really like to know who you are. That would be great. But Sir Gus, I've got a question. And uh, if you were able to change the federal government's mind and lift uh, Australia's contribution to foreign aid from that 0.3, well, it's 0.29% to 0.7%, what would be the first thing you would do with the money? Well, having worked in health all my life, I'd have to say it was health. Having uh, become an immunologist, I'd have to say it would be in the field of prevention. And what better thing to do than to give a jolly big boost to the George Institute. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, then there's, that's a, a bit of a segue, isn't it? Uh, to Stephen or Robin. Um, so what would you do with your boost or your booster? Look, I, I think um, I, I think we would uh, ho continue to do what we do now, expand what we do now. Um, you know, as, as Mike has indicated, we have a strong focus on prevention. Um, but the reality is, in the world today, there are so many people who have existing diseases that are going to kill them that there is a tremendous need to find innovative ways to treat people as well as to prevent diseases. So it's a balance of those two things. In the long run, we're going to get better value, in a sense, from prevention. But there is an acute human need uh, to prevent all the, all the deaths that will occur in the next couple of decades among people who've already got the diseases now. Now, I was struck by the photograph inside a hut in India, a man and woman there, and talk of um, wireless and apps in helping in terms of prevention. Um, can you walk us through, one of you, as to what's happening in India in terms of some of the prevention models which might be empowering other health workers, particularly local health workers? Well, uh, exactly. I mean, we, we have um, a lot of programs, and Sir Gus and I have been speaking about this today, but the perhaps the single greatest breakthrough in medical technology is mobile phones. Um, and it's going to allow us to create a much bigger workforce, healthcare workforce at a much lower price. And that's fundamentally a critical component to uh, improving the quality of healthcare and the access to healthcare in low middle income countries. Um, a country like India at the moment has uh, about uh, three or 400,000 doctors. It needs about three or four million doctors to have anything like the sort of ratio of doctors to patients as is in this country. So the reality is doctors are not going to be part of the solution at the ground level. They can't be. They just aren't enough and they're too expensive. So what we're looking at and what we're interested in is how can we use, for example, village healthcare workers? How can we empower them with mobile technology, simple mobile technology that allows them to diagnose common diseases such as many of those that... Uh, Gus has referred to, as well as diabetes, heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, which are the new diseases of development, and provide absolutely high quality but low cost care. Um, and to date, the, the, the evidence looks really impressive. You can train a, for two weeks a, um, a village healthcare worker who's had maybe two years of high school education and how to identify people who've got, had a heart attack, identify people who've had a stroke, and make recommendations about the drugs they should be on. And within over the next six months, we compared their performance relative to the local doctors. They were better at diagnosing disease and they were better at making the recommendations for treatment. And they cost about one twentieth of the price of a doctor. So, you know, there, I think we're on the edge of fundamental, if you like, disruptive transformation of healthcare. And that's what the world needs. And Sir Gus, is that something that gives you hope? And we're, we're talking about South Asia. And I think when you talk about despair and, and you talk about Pakistan, a lot of people think, what are we going to do about Pakistan and, and polio? And I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts there. Well, look, I think what uh, as Stephen said is absolute music to my ears. Uh, I was telling him earlier that my first interactions with WHO occurred when Hafsan Mala was Director General. And he was absolutely enthused about the Chinese death of doctors there. In other words, really saying what you're saying, that for a lot of things you don't need it, seven-year trained doctor, you can do it for the health auxiliary. And I think that strategy has got real legs and uh, could be a very good pathway forward. Now, do we have some questions? One's a little bit shy. Oh, we do. Um, Justice Kirby, Michael Kirby. Um, we might just pass the microphone. <coughs> I'm Michael Kirby, and I, I'd like to thank uh, Sir Gustav for his wonderful um, oration in honor of such a wonderful person as my prefect, John Liu. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question I have, I, if I can be allowed two. One, when I was on the Global Commission on AIDS, um, Luc Montignier and Robert Gallo both said we would have the vaccine within 10 years. Now. What I, I've never quite got my mind around is, why did that not happen? What is it about HIV that has proved such an impediment? And the second question is, you guys are going on 
saving all these lives. And that's a wonderful thing on an individual level. But what are you doing about the problem of gross overpopulation in our world, about lots of angry young men who don't have jobs, uh, about the fact that you're increasing the pool of these people who on an individual level is a, an admirable and wonderful thing, but on a global level is a real problem for our planet. More meat, more animals being killed, more uh, uh, problems with supply and so on. So I'd like to know, is there a vaccine being produced that is going <laughs> consensually to reduce the mass overpopulation of our planet? Because otherwise we're, you are leading us to even more problems than we have. I think we might have to stick with the first question. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, as uh, I might have expected, two absolutely superb questions. Both of them demand a serious answer. Uh, the failure to progress uh, with a reasonable vaccine has been a shocking disappointment. It's not because of a lack of trying. It's roughly speaking, a billion dollars a year being spent on research towards an HIV AIDS vaccine. I think it is mainly that this foe is devilishly clever. And it's really got two strategies that are frustrating us. First of all, it's an RNA retrovirus that means it's very, very mutable. And interestingly enough, it's now been discovered that when a person gets infected with HIV, it's one, or at the most, a small number of virions that actually do the job. With modern DNA technology, modern RNA technology, in this case, DNA technology made to RNA, you can chart the mutation. As soon as the immune response hits that virus, it mutates away, bang, dodges away from the immune attack. And as soon as the new immune response is made to that variant, it dodges away again and does that over and over again. You can actually chart this. There's wonderful genetic trees of HIV in individual patients that have been created. That's the first reason, it's very mutable. The second reason is it lurks. It lurks. It goes inside cells, and in many cases, it integrates into the genome of those cells, and then really only comes out again at unpredictable times. So if I was now to take a patient with uh, HIV, the seroconversion, or 20,000 virus particles per mil of blood, and hit them with highly active antiretroviral therapy, that virus load will very quickly go down and will reach, probably in most cases, reaches undetectable, which means less than 50 particles per million blood. Stop the therapy. <laughs> Within weeks, the virus bounces back. It's been in those hiding places, inside cells, inside the nuclei of cells, and that's a very clever strategy which makes it difficult for us. None of it is an excuse. And I wish it were not so, and there are clever ideas coming forward, but I would hate to put a time frame on when we'll have that vaccine. Now, the second question is a very important one, because there have been people who have argued that reducing childhood mortality in these very poor countries, and therefore having uh, rid of a population explosion, is a terrible thing to do, because you only make things worse by having more overpopulation than you would have had. But to that, I can give a very clear-cut answer. Uh, and there's people far more knowledgeable in, in demography than I am who substantiate this. The way to control population size is not through having high death rates. It's through having low birth rates. And if, in point of fact, you chart a chart of poverty versus the number of children people have and versus population growth, they all go together. The poorest countries are the people who have the most children, and they've got to have one, and preferably two, male heirs to look after them in their old age because there's, no, uh, there's no social security. So that's why they have too many children, they overpopulate. As soon as you transition to a slightly lesser degree of affluence, and as soon as you can guarantee, so sorry, slightly lesser degree of poverty, greater degree of affluence, uh, and those children are looking as though they're going to live. People spontaneously themselves, by whatever means they have available to them, reduce family size. And it's been shown time after time. Now, there is a point, could be a bit of a demographic bubble in the transition, where the claim that you're making things worse might for a very brief period have some validity. 
but in point of fact, the answer is you want a, uh, a lowered birth rate, not an increased death rate. Now, of course, there could be a birth control vaccine. There are birth control vaccines. At the moment, they've got to the side effects. And yes, we need more methods of birth control applicable in developing countries, suitable for the ethical and social norms of those countries. And we need that perhaps even more importantly than we need vaccines. May I just ask a question there? And thank you, Sagas, and I'd like to bring Robin in as well. Um, but I suppose a lot of us, um, when we're talking about, um, you know, the scourge of TB, of AIDS, of polio, we think of the crisis in, in West Africa and Ebola. And if I could just have each of your thoughts briefly on that, and then I'd love to bring in another question. Well, there's, of course, uh, companies that are extremely eager to parade themselves as making an Ebola virus vaccine very, very quickly. Uh, and there are several strategies here. One of them, I think the one that is most popular, is the thought that you would get some genes from the Ebola virus and put them into a harmless vector, uh, like that failed vaccine of Helen McShane's for tuberculosis. And there's you know, quite advanced work going on for that. And that can be done very quickly. However, I have to utter one note of caution. Supposing someone were to invent an Ebola vaccine and supposing a company were to promote it, uh, is that going to be cost effective? When we know that public health measures, dreadful though this disease is, good old fashioned public health measures do control it. And we've been seeing a lot of Australians at the forefront of some of that care and the introduction of some of those public health measures. Um, Robin, can I'd like to know what Robin thinks. Yes. I, I guess the only comment I, I can't talk a lot about Ebola, because clearly that's not my area of focus. But I think one of the things that I've been struck with with the reporting there is the issue of health education mm -hmm. and people's knowledge of what to do and what not to do. And that strikes me as, again, an area where we need to put more resource. So it's not Health diplomacy? A, well, in, in this case, it's really about how, how do we educate the public? So it, 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 it comes back to the issue of prevention, it comes back to the issue of knowledge, and where are we putting the resource? It's often not in those areas, and that's clearly something that that, that strikes one very much in this case. Well, I totally agree with that. Uh, education is massively important. Uh, but, you know, we've had some narrow escapes. Remember SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome? Remember MERS, the middle uh, European respiratory syndrome? Also, uh, bird flu, and a million chickens in Hong Kong get killed in that. Public health measures work. The old-fashioned quarantine, it really works. But you've got to apply it early, you've got to apply it rigorously. You've got to have no denial, like the Chinese had first over the, uh, over the SARS and nearly wrecked everything for the whole world. But, um, uh, you know, that's not to say, of course, we'd welcome a vaccine. But we mustn't forget the, the lessons of history and the lessons of the past. And maybe this is an opportunity also, as we talked before, about mobile technologies the use of social media, how we can bring that to play in these, the, these instances is something we need to be thinking about much more. Look, I'd like to wind up. We've got one more question from the Chairman. Use your big voice. Remind me of a story I heard from my second boss. My first boss, the main boss, was of course Sir McFarlane Burnett, the great Australian virologist. But my second boss was a real slow coach of a guy. His name was Joshua Lederberg. He had to wait till he was 33 till he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> second youngest ever. Anyhow, Joshua was an incredible brain. And uh, he said to me one day, Gus, these bacteria with which you're uh, working. They multiply every 20 minutes, I say yes. 
uh, how often does a human being mother die? About every 25 years. I said, who stopped this DNA is going to win the race? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is obvious. You know, the only thing that does five tree explosions is our brain. Because they're nimble and they're fast and they mutate exactly as you say. And in the case of influenza, the <coughs> what we call shift variants, those variants that cause pandemics, as you say, roughly three times a century, uh, they're usually due to recombination with an animal virus. And that happens not incredibly commonly. And yes, please don't be complacent. I mean, uh, my, my former colleague, Anne Kelso, who now runs the WHO Collaborating Centre for Influenza, only one in the Southern Hemisphere in Melbourne. Uh, I mean, frankly, she was terrified of a pandemic strain of flu. It killed more people in 1918, 19 than all the wars of that horrible great war. More, far more people. And it could happen again. Are we being vigilant to be enough? We've got to be vigilant, as uh, uh, I think with you said, uh, you, Robin said, we've got to be educated. We've got to keep these facts very well in mind. And, of course, in the presence of my dear friend, Dr. Roberts, I've got to say, we've got to spend money on medical research. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we'll take one final question there. Clark McConaughey. By far the biggest number that you had up on the screen there was the three trillion dollars that went to the cost of, uh, I think you had Iraq up there, so over 10 years, most um, So that's 300 billion a year, the figure of annual cost of violence, about triple that. So I'm just wondering from your experience whether you either scientifically know or subjectively think that the spread of the diseases that you're talking about there is related to the spread of violence because there's a certain chunk of money there that could well pay for a lot of the bills. Um, and as Stephen well, knows, I've presented that all over the world. Uh, one thing that is absolutely certain is that this uh, end game of the polio is being frustrated by violence. There is no doubt about that. There's some of those areas of the Afghanistan, Pakistan border that the vaccinators just can't go into because they're too dangerous. And the Taliban will get you. And by the way, you know why that is? They say it is because the polio vaccine is really a Western plot to render female Muslim babies sterile. Isn't that a good one? I've heard some beauties, but that's one of the best that I've heard. But yeah, I mean, violence uh, and disruption of social norms and so forth is very much at the center of all of this. And if we could have civil societies even the poorer countries can vastly improve their health by present-day methodologies, skillfully applied. And, uh, you know, who could, who could wish for anything more than a peaceful world? It's, uh, it's a consummation devoutly to be wished. Thank you very much to our panellists. It's time to wind up now. Thank you so much for your participation. We've got a lot to contemplate, a lot to keep us awake at night, and also hope. And I admit to feeling deeply in awe of the work the three of you do, and with your institutes and your colleagues, and enlivened by the possibilities. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Robin. And of course, thank you, Sir Gus Nossel.